Excellent. Thank you so much, Jawad. Uh, really privileged, privileged to be here. Uh, we have a lot of long-standing ties with Suncup and, and a lot of good things have happened through Suncup, both in the physical events and the virtual events. Uh, so very glad to uh, take a session here today. My name is Nir Chor. I'm the CEO of Bangladesh Angels. I want to welcome everyone uh, to this session. Uh, so I'll go ahead and introduce our speakers. Uh, so we'll start obviously uh, this panel or this discussion is kind of broken down into two parts. So one is a specific kind of overview of both Bangladesh, but then also a deeper dive into a case study uh, with an impact enterprise that also has longstanding South Cup ties, uh, reverse resources. And then second, the second part, I'll be leading a discussion amongst ecosystem leaders from Bangladesh, from the, the impact side, from the angel investment side, as well as the, the VC side and government and policy perspective as well. Uh, so for the first speaker, uh, Anne Ronell, is the founder and CEO of Reverse Resources. For the past 10 years, she has been deeply involved in building the circular economy in the fashion industry from approaching the digital SaaS startup perspective, systems change and global scale level while running her business from Estonia. As one of founding partners of Circular Fashion Partnership, Reverse Resources is collaborating with 20 of the largest global fashion brands to build uh, circularity uh, of their uh, and circulation uh, within their textile production waste. Uh, welcome and good to have you here. I don't know uh, if she can hear. Me. <laughs> no worries. Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, the uh, microphone was mute. So yeah, hi. Thanks no for being right. <laughs> No worries. It's always a pleasure, Anne, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we work together as well, particularly thanks to Sankal. Uh, the next speaker, uh, very uh, happy to present uh, Mr. Sajid Rahman. Uh, Sajid Rahman is the founding general partner at My Asia VC. He is an early investor in 10 plus unicorns and has built a digital health business serving 5 million people. He's also on the board of a number of public and private companies. Uh, Sajid Bhai, if you're with us, uh, welcome. Okay, no worries. Uh, otherwise, I'll just keep moving. Uh, Maxime Cheng is the next speaker. Uh, Maxime is the team lead of market and capacity building programs at Roots of Impact, an impact-linked finance advisory firm based in Germany. She's also the program manager of the impact investing ecosystem uh, building program Biniog Bridhi or B Bridhi in Bangladesh, working with the Embassy of Switzerland and Light Castle Partners to address both supply and demand side of the Bangladeshi impact investing pipeline. Throughout her 10 plus years of experience working in the sector of impact entrepreneurship, she gathers expertise in impact measurement uh, and is a skilled translator of the subject to both impact entrepreneurs and investors and facilitate over 10 impact linked finance transactions globally as of today. Uh, welcome, Maxime. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Excellent. Uh, it, it's no joke. She has also uh, trained Jawad and myself as well, so she could tell you more about that. Uh, but th yeah, thank you so much, Maxine, for, for being with us. Uh, and then last but not least, I know she's running a little bit late, but we'll still uh, you know, introduce her, uh, Ms. Tina Jabin, who's kindly joining us from the West Coast of the U.S. It's quite late for her. Uh, most recently, Tina served as the founding managing director and CEO of Startup Bangladesh Limited, a wholly owned VC of the government of Bangladesh. In 2020, Tina led the ICT ministry's establishment and launch of the Venture Fund to support the country's fledgling startup sector. Tina brings 25 years of Silicon Valley experience in collaborating in, on complex projects across multiple stakeholder groups. Since 2016, Ms. Jabin has served as the investment advisor to Startup Bangladesh Idea Project in the ICT division, where she spearheaded major strategy and technical initiatives of the project. Tina has assisted the ICT ministry in policy and investment initiatives with other governments and private industries across across Asia, North America, and Europe. Tina's network of ac uh, access includes numerous foreign government agencies, as well as private companies in technology, banking, healthcare, private equity, venture capital, and accelerators. As senior advisor, she promoted she promoted ICT divisions, entrepreneurship, and startup ecosystem initiatives at prestigious international forums such as the World Economic Forum in Davos and the United Nations Capital Development Fund and SCAP. Uh, we'll hear from her later as well. But uh, Jawad, I'll let you take it away towards the first half, and then I'll come back in a second. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, uh, Nirjar, for setting the tone for this uh, session today. Um, and as you all know, this is uh, titled Emergence and Impact of the Neo-Bengal Tigers Startup Ecosystem. 
I'll start off with a brief overview of Bangladesh and how it presents itself as a market and an opportunity for not only angel investors, VCs, but also impact investors, right? Uh, Bangladesh is one of the fastest growing economies in the world. A country of 165 million people, it's experiencing benefits of densi density dividend and has resulted in an impressive annual average growth, growth rate of about 6.5% over the last decade. Alongside a strong manufacturing sector, Bangladesh's market, uh, markets for digital penetrations are increasing and boosting ICT and startup activities. Some noteworthy, noteworthy trends to mention, uh, microfinan uh, microfinancial services uh, are growing steadily over at least 20% CAGR over the last five years. The e-commerce market is expected to grow at $3 billion by the end of 2023 and the ICT sector growing around 40% annually since 2010. And FDIs has grown 4X in the last decade alone. Moreover, there's an emergence of the middle and, middle and affluent population, around 20 million, 20 million people here who are young, tech savvy, and optimistic of the future to invest locally into Bangladesh. And this group is expected to double in the next five years. As you may already know, Bangladesh has the third most active impact Investment, investment market in Southeast Asia. Till date, VFIs have deployed over 830 million, uh, while other impact investors have added 120 million more. The overall funding in, uh, encompasses development institutions to even impact-oriented technology companies, mainly startups. There are roughly 1,200 active startups in Bangladesh with 200 newborns every year. Majority of them, if not all, have an impact mandate or are solving a critical social problem through technology. Over the last five years, the sector has attracted FDI funding of about $400 million, taking into account Shop Up's uh, recent announcement, announcement of $75 million uh, Series B round, led by Peter Thiel's Valar Ventures, along with existing VC investors, Process Ventures, Flourish Ventures, Vion Ventures, and lastly, but not the least, Sequoia Capital India. Back in 2015, the largest check was about $11 million um, for an impact enterprise, which was Bikash, the country's largest mobile, mobile financial institution. And it was cut by Melinda and Bill Gates uh, Foundation and identified as a potential unicorn of the country. IFC backing Chaldal, and they have also recently announced their $10 million Series C round and while me sole share also accumulated about uh, $4.1 million till date. And this is just the start of the impact entrepreneurs um, that is leading Bangladesh's startup ecosystems revolution. We have also recently witnessed uh, banks and NBFIs considering diversifying their portfolio and backing startups with structures provided by Bangladesh Bank and also supported by the government of Bangladesh, leading to some of the you know, latest and most important macro trends that we have right now. About 600,000 IT professionals graduate every year. There's over 100 plus high-tech parks being built around the country, $100 million plus in alternative investments that has been announced or registered in Bangladesh in the last five years, and $60 million government VC fund led by Startup Bangladesh Limited and TINAPA, who will be uh, speaking uh, later today. These interventions have led close to 2 million jobs by the startup ecosystem. However, Bangladesh has largely remained underfunded over the last decade compared, compared to their regional peers and with similar macro trends. The FDI overall um, is accounting for about 0.63% of GDP. In this session, we, we want to spotlight the inherent challenges and opportunities for it attracting international capital into Bangladesh. To start off our discuss discussion today, we will be showcasing reverse resources an Estonian Bangladeshi clean tech company who we met last year at this year at Sankal Global Summit 2020. Over the course of the year, the company has managed to secure their first seed investment of 850,000 euros, which can lead up to a million euros led by angels based in Estonia, Singapore, Dubai, India, and lastly, Bangladesh, who were band members. So without further ado, I wanna introduce and bring forth Andrew Nell, the founder and CEO of Reverse Resources. Uh, for the past 10 years, she has been deeply involved in building the circular economy in the fashion industry from the approaching the digital SaaS startup perspective, systems change and global scale level while running her business from Estonia. 
as one of the founding partners of Circular Fashion Partnership, Reverse Resources is collaborating with 20 of the largest global fashion brands to build circular um, circulation of their textile production waste. Welcome, welcome to the stage, Anne Rennell, to brief, briefly present the case study for uh, Reverse Resources. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, so yeah, my name is Anne, um, founder and uh, CEO of Reverse Resources. And the, the company uh, I established seven years ago uh, after already visited Bangladesh before that. But uh, the reason was that, uh, that uh, coming from Estonia, uh, which is like a high, highly digital society, um, I, I got, and, um, I was really interested in circular economy and I found Bangladesh to be kind of like a gold mine for waste uh, because there is just so much similar type of waste materials available um, from production. So it was just like a very logical place for, for us to start, uh, to, to kind of start uh, telling a, a story of circular economy uh, to the world. And, and for us, I would say that another thing that uh, why Bangladesh has been appealing uh, country to to start working from is actually the the level of uh, like in in Europe we have so much rule, regulation already established around waste management, which in Bangladesh wasn't the case. We so we had like a, a empty playing field to start testing and trialing um, together with a lot of cotton waste lying around. So uh, for us, it's just make, made a lot of sense to kind of come. Um, start uh, saving the world from from Bangladesh, um, but uh, but yeah, the, this journey for seven years has been super exciting in in terms of how how to start explaining something very complicated uh, to to the whole globe because startups usually start in their own country. They they do uh, like a small case study or a trial and then start expanding. For us in, in working in circular economy, the, the logic is kind of upside down. Uh, with waste materials, we have to start big and then go small, smaller. So our first target has all, was always the largest global fashion brands to help them to start mapping their own waste and make it there visible how much waste there is and how, how to take that uh, to, to their recyclers. Um, and and uh, it took us really long time to to get that dialogue going with the, with the large brands, and and I think it, it made a lot of sense for us to be European running our first um, target market in Bangladesh, because all the brands that we actually are the, the main client we have are the, the the brands with their headquarters in Europe, so so that's why for us it made a lot of sense. But uh, but the experience of, of working in in Bangladesh from 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 Estonia, where in Estonia we have a very strongly established uh, um, startup uh, ecosystem, and and the, I, I kind of have a, a set of expectations of how startup community works, and in Bangladesh it was very very long time that I didn't find any link linkages. Maybe I wasn't looking in from the right place because we weren't in tech sector, we weren't in um, yeah we weren't locally actually present uh, for a long time. So I was really happy that I uh, stumbled upon Bangladeshi Angels uh, last year to discover that there is actually there is an ecosystem to uh, taking or starting to to live itself there. Um, so yeah. It's been an interesting journey, and and for uh, just a comment about us uh, raising funds, um, I, I would say that fashion industry in general doesn't do startups. It's it it, it doesn't haven't hasn't seen startup type of action before. Uh, so it's another layer of, of doing something very different and doing startup in fashion sector, uh, because in in fashion I think we see a lot of. Um, uh, new companies from, from 
from the like, designer brand level or new materials or these kind of very traditional things, but doing an IT startup in fashion industry on the industry and manufacturing side is just quite a unique thing. And, and that's an additional level of no funds moving into that space. Uh, and, and in that uh, way, it, uh, it was a really, it took us seven years to raise first seed fund because we were first pitching to Estonian angels who said that, oh yeah, but I don't know anything about fashion industry. I don't know anything about Bangladesh, like go off somewhere else. Then we were going around in Bangladesh instant, initially for the first few years, we had an impression that there basically are no angel investors in, in Bangladesh. And uh, then, then we looked around in uh, India and, Sri and Singapore and, and there the market situation is slightly different than Bangladesh. So from Indian investors, we got the feedback that, oh, but you must have got this somehow wrong, that like the situation, the problem you're trying to solve isn't here. Like there must be something off here. So they didn't have that same feeling of the industry of the, the market situation. So that made our journey to explain this to investors really, really difficult. But, but luckily we managed to live for six years from all kinds of grants and awards because fashion industry really, really has had a really big problem around their, their waste and circular economy. So yeah, I'll stop here. <laughs> No, absolutely. I think uh, the last time, uh, around this time last year, when we, you know, found your uh, company at Sankalp, right? And uh, we remember that uh, it was still largely donor-led. Um, the model that you had, um, it wasn't backed up by any VCs or, you know, um, angel investors at that point in time. How was your journey um, to, you know, pivot to a, you know, impact? Uh, you were in the SaaS business, right? You were in the, you know, uh, B2B SaaS arena. How, um, you know, hard was it for you to sort of pivot to this model and also you know make sure that the investors understand where you're headed for um you know the next trajectory mm -hmm. well i think when i when i look back i would say that the first six years we actually were, were more like an ngo or a, a research company uh, we, we were just digging into the problem and trying to understand how this whole system works and and it really took us time and then i think we were as as many startups probably like want to believe that they are doing business but they aren't yet so so it it uh, it, it was very classical moment of when we, our tra traction on on our platform started to grow grow from that day instantly we got the interest from from the investors um so it's it's now we're kind of transitioning uh, also as an organization from this research ngo type of thinking into SaaS business and how to really drive this as a business um and and it's it's kind of really cool to see how the traction numbers are going up how we are like on a uh, monthly basis getting more and more factories on the platform we now have first uh contract with uh, one of the biggest brands uh, to do waste mapping across their factories. We are piloting with another 20 brands. Um, so it's there is now clarity of, of what the business model really is. It is really complicated, complex business, uh, business model. And I think our innovation mainly is not in the tech side that it's technically not that difficult thing that we're doing, but it really is a business case innovation, how we are using technology to incentivize different stakeholders to come together and do something in a very logic, uh, in a process that has never been done before. Uh, so yeah, I guess I distracted from the question you had, but. <laughs> No, I think uh, it's a really good answer and it sort of is uh, encompassing of the overall general thematics, right? Um, but I want to go into um, what led you to sort of pivot to Bangladesh. When I found out it was an Estonian Bangladeshi company, it actually caught the attention not only from Bangladeshi investors, but uh, what was your initial thoughts uh, pivoting to Bangladesh as well as um, how has been the reception been uh, adopting your technology and your platform from the businesses that you're working here with? Uh, I would say that uh, we have been more of a Bangladeshi company than Estonian company from the very beginning, <clears throat> because um, yeah, we are 
the headquarters registered in Estonia and, and the development team in Estonia, but but the all the like the problem and the processes and everything is is in Bangladesh. Um, and and there uh, the reason really is that uh, in Estonia we have almost no textile industry. Uh, initially, I obviously started in Estonia doing waste mapping here, and I think the the outcome was that we can get something like five tons of uh, cotton waste from Estonia, uh, whereas in in Bangladesh it's four hundred thousand tons per year. Uh, so it's uh, it's just like. The industry, the textile industry, is there in Bangladesh. So it, it, Bangladesh is one of the biggest producers, and it's very cotton-heavy producers of, of textiles. So wanting to solve that circular economy problem for fashion industry, Bangladesh was just the logical place to start. Absolutely, and I hear you with the, the you know one of the largest uh, you know garment. A manufacturing side uh, that we have in the country, and that makes per perfect sense. Can you share some, you know, recent traction updates in terms of how many factories have you been working with? What are the plans that are coming up for 2022? Um, now that you have uh, received or at least closed uh, the majority of your round. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I would say that we are still in the very beginning. Um, we now have 43 factories from Bangladesh regularly using our platform on a daily basis. Uh, we have a project going on that targets uh, 1,500 factories by next year. Um, not only Bangladesh anymore. Um, so we're instantly expanding to other countries, but Bangladesh is the so-called beachhead market where we are have been and continue demonstrating the whole model to to the full scale of it we are we are just um i i think we are excep exceptional because we are actually together with this uh, our software platform opening up a new market which usually i think startups actually enter a market that is already there so um it's it's not it, it's part of our journey is to grow together with the brands and then move into this uh, uh, space and create that space even. So it's uh, we are on on that journey discovering what even needs to be done and how this whole model works out. So um, Bangladesh remains to be that center point of of really creating that whole. Uh, model to work first and then copying it in other countries uh, so yeah through the circular fashion partnership project that we're running with uh, global fashion agenda now uh, and, and collaborating with this 20, 20 brands uh, we are also uh, going in deep next year we're, we're plan planning to go deeper into the dialogue with policy uh, makers to understand how can the policy support uh, better waste management um, because it, it can't be um, only that pressure from from outside it has to be in internal processes as well um, otherwise it just uh, wouldn't work out so there is a lot to do um, there is a lot of resistance from from Bangladeshi market still there is a lot of uh, a lot of fears a lot of unknown uh, digital using digital tools it's not the common thing to do so um yeah i, I yeah i can definitely list a, a lot more challenges than than the victories we have right now but the start is is amazing excellent um and uh being cognizant of time i'll keep to my last question for you um in terms of um your plans for net the next round um how does that look like uh, what kind of investors you want to bring onto the table i know maxim is here and uh, there might be a hard uh, you know offer from the vinio grid the table um if you want to you know draw some you know um identities or what kind of partners that you're looking for for the next round to you know take place mm, we are uh, planning to start uh, next round uh, preparation for next round in mid uh, next year. Uh, it's not uh, fully decided if the round is going to be two, two or five million, but it's in that range. Um, 
we are still going to combine our financial need with uh, grants and awards because we are in that space of getting a lot of uh, free money. Um, so that also um, creates, um, yeah, changes or changes our, our strategy uh, probably next year uh, when we get that in place. But uh, we are definitely looking for strategic investors who want to help uh, participate in that material flow. Um, I think all kinds of um, uh, large suppliers who are, want to set up uh, recycling for themselves will gain a lot of value from, from the platform and could be potentially good investors for us. We already have one such investor from India uh, who initially was or is also our client uh, sourcing waste from us and also became an investor. Um, we are probably gonna get investment from some of the brands that we work with. Uh, um, we, as we have had these discussions already started. Um, so I, I think the, the next investment will significantly come from the industry itself. But I also am always really happy to talk to different VCs from other sectors, because as said, fashion industry doesn't have VC investors. And any, any investor that I ever talk to, they are, they are new to this topic. And, and uh, some of the investors, uh, you know, actually most of the investors who are with us right now have been coming into this topic thanks to us. It's not that they already invest somewhere else and, and they try to grow their portfolio, but we are the first entry into this whole topic. And there is a lot happening. So, yeah, I'm always happy to, to share my knowledge and, uh, and shed some light that's happening in that very conservative space. Excellent. And I think we would be love, uh, you know, we would love to be part of the next round as well and uh, happy to speak and co continue the conversation even after this. And hopefully we can draw out another, you know, chapter of this, uh, you know, session with Sankalp as well and come back next year with a, you know, new round that we can announce. Uh, but with that, um, I think we, let's move on to the second, uh, you know, part of the session where we are, you know, inviting our VCs as well as the ecosystem actors um, led by Nirchur Rahman's uh, moderation to take um, center stage. Here's your, please take it over. No worries. Thank you so much, Chawad, and, and thank you so much, Anne, uh, and, and welcome back, uh, you know, Maxime, Sajid Pai, and, and Tina Appa as well. So I think in the first half of the conversation, you heard from the uh, from both Jawad, but also a particular company and, and the challenges of, I think, raising capital, particularly as, as an enterprise that happens to be in a lot of cross sections. Um, and, and so that was a really great case study. Thank you so much, Anne. I think now we'll hear from some of the ecosystem leaders, particularly investment leaders uh, and, and their perspectives from a few different angles. Uh, so we'll first kind of go to Maxime. Uh, so Maxime, you know, th once again, thank you so much for, for being here. Uh, could you tell us, just to kind of set the context, about Roots of Impact's role in the Bangladesh Impact ecosystem through the Binyok Ruthi program and the relevant work streams? Sure, happy to. Um, if that's okay, I'm actually, I would like to share one of my um, slides. So it's a bit clearer to everyone in terms of what we are trying to um, deliver in Bangladesh. Do you all see the screen properly? Yes. Perfect. So um, Bini Obridi is a program um, that's uh, Roots of Impact together with the Embassy of Switzerland in Bangladesh, as well as the Lycastle like, Partners in Bangladesh. Um, it's a co-creation. Uh, it's a public-private uh, development partnership. Um, it came about because we saw that uh, in Bangladesh, uh, there has been a huge um, growth. Um, but at the same time, we also see that this is uh, the right time to also intervene and encourage a pro poor uh, business concept, uh, particularly the idea of impact entrepreneurship so that as the economy is growing, um, we try to bring everyone involved instead of leaving some part of the population behind. 
And so what we're trying to do with Binio Breedy since the launch last year is that we try to uh, address both the supply and demand side of the impact investing market uh, by offering uh, three different pillars of activities. The first one being the capacity building uh, activities, which I'll explain in a little bit. And then uh, second, which is to offer two types of catalytic financing instruments to um, impact entrepreneurs at different stage. And then also finally, uh, efficacy uh, work that, for example, we do a lot of um, work together with the National Advisory Board of Impact Investing in Bangladesh. Um, and we have been supporting them to come up with a Bangladesh Impact Investing Strategic and Action Plan, for example. So this is uh, an overview because it's so vast. I think it's just like helpful to share a slide so that is uh, easier for everyone to understand what we're trying to create. Um, it's not uh, common to have a program that try to incorporate all these different elements in one. Uh, but at the same time, we do believe that um, the, the design of how it works uh, with the capacity building part uh, fitting slowly into a pipeline of uh, enterprises that are ready to take up investment and also supported by the efficacy work that we're doing on the policy level as well as government level. So specifically when it comes to capacity building, we actually uh, offer three different types of activities. The first one being uh, uh, at the very beginning of the pipeline for companies that, or startups that are uh, right after the ideation phase, we offer access to an online incubation platform called Bridge for Billions, um, so that they can also go through the incubation process in a very structured way that also adds values to the local intermediaries in terms of how they structure the training and support to the uh, startups. And um, it's an um, interesting period also to launch this platform and incorporate it in our program because the Binio Brady program started right at the onset of the global pandemic. And uh, it's also the time when all of us have to get used to online and virtual interaction. So that really uh, show and demonstrate its value during that particular period of time. And we believe that would also remain a common practice from now on. The second part of what we are offering uh, is to the incubators or intermediaries is the train the trainer program, uh, which we pick two specific topics that are essential to impact investing, uh, which is investment readiness and also impact measurement and management. Uh, so how it works is that we uh, offer trainings to selected intermediaries, for example, uh, Bangladesh Angels Network is part of it, uh, and also many other intermediaries that has been active in the impact entrepreneurship scene, uh, so that they are equipped with the ability to support impact entrepreneurs that they support, um, spe uh, specifically on these two topics, so that uh, they would be able to uh, go a bit forward and be more equipped when it comes to raising impact investment later on. Um, and then finally, uh, under the capacity building pillar, we also offer something called the voucher scheme, in which the trainers that we have trained and passed the exam, they are able to uh, work together with impact enterprises to come up with a proposal uh, and identify, first of all, what are the gaps that these impact enterprises have when it comes to impact measurement and investment readiness understanding, and then to come up with a tailored proposal to work on them. Um, and we offer the vouchers to the impact enterprise uh, so that they're able to pay for the service offered by the trainers. Um, by with such a design, we actually hope to create a market that it is something that there will be um, a sustainable market going forward for services on these two topics instead of continuously um, dependent on grounds um, for these services to be offered. Um, so that's a voucher scheme. Uh, we also offer uh, the voucher scheme and structure in such a way that there will be a bonus payment for the trainers if they deliver high quality and also the outcome. For example, if you offer investment readiness services, uh, whether you manage to raise funds successfully at the end, that's really the outcome that we aim for. So there's also a bonus payment linked to that. And then um, now we move on to the uh, catalytic funding part, which uh, in the Breedy program, we offer two specific instruments. 
Uh, the first one being impact ready matching funds, which is a one to one matching fund concept for slightly earlier stage uh, impact enterprises uh, that has an impact angle, but do not necessarily have a system in place to capture the impact data, which is essential when it comes to structuring an impact length finance or to enter any sort of impact investing uh, agreement with investors. Um, and another instrument that we introduce is social impact incentives, which we have been um, using since 2016 across the world for, uh, at Root of Impact in our different programs. Um, for social impact incentives, we target at uh, impact entrepreneurs at growth stage, uh, ready to grow and scale their impact. Um, the requirement in terms of impact measurement is higher because we really need a lot of data uh, to see what they have been performing, what would be the baseline, so on and so forth. And so uh, generally the um, expectation uh, from the impact entrepreneurs is also higher. This is also a matching fund concept, but uh, not a one-to-one. -one. So usually the average ticket size that we are offering for social impact incentives is 250K US dollar. And uh, for companies that are aiming to raise uh, between 500 to a million uh, USD um, kind of ticket size as they grow. So these are the two instruments that we have introduced. So far, we have closed uh, five um, impact ready matching funds in Bibridi, and we're in the process of closing three other deals from the cohort of this year. Uh, we have also closed two social impact incentives transaction in the past year, and there's also three more in the pipeline that we are in the process of closing. Um, just so that you know, we are also organizing a showcasing event on the 11th of November. So if you're interested to know more about these two instruments, how they work, stay tuned. And finally, also the efficacy work, as I mentioned earlier, we work very closely with the National Advisory Board of Impact Investing to support uh, on the policy level or also on the macro ecosystem level, what are the support that could be required to enable this uh, either on infrastructure level or to enable the, the ecosystem players to thrive and uh, enable the impact investing uh, market to grow. Um, some recommendations that will be coming out of the BICEP report, including, of course, impact measurement and management have a standardized uh, language about it, but then also other activities, for example, uh, is there something that we could look into in terms of uh, regulation or in terms of facilitating uh, the conversation among the different ecosystem players, including investors and government players. So, yeah, I would say that's like kind of um, not like be pretty in a nutshell. I'm happy to elaborate or explain more. Over to you, Nisho. Well, thank you so much for the uh, overview. And it's quite clear what the three elements are, the kind of, I guess, um, uh, the three gears, right? Catal capacity development, catalytic funds, and then policy and advocacy. Um, you know, a question came in, so I'll try to weave that in. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, beyond the company, you know, the companies that got the catalytic funds. Uh, just curious, you know, how many total companies, impact enterprises are within the Bibridi universe, so to speak? Uh, and also as part of that, you know, what challenges do you face in kind of scaling a capacity building programs like this? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, if you're asking how many impact entrepreneurs are receiving support. Um, so last year, for example, under the voucher scheme, I think we had 17 uh, vouchers. Um, some are slightly over, uh, let me think, yeah, 17, I would say around that. And then in the, um, this year we are in the process of vetting the application. So there will be more by the end of this month. Uh, we will kickstart the support. And then when it comes to um, Bridge for Billions, we also, um, I think we have already offer um, around 50 licenses so far. So I guess, all in all around close to 100 by the end of this year yeah that's excellent almost um five percent of the ecosystem according to to jawa's numbers and yeah <laughs> just, just and just curious you know what, what challenges have you had or do you foresee i guess as this program continues and expands because it is a multi-year program right mm -hmm. yeah so right now um for phase one of the new Bridi program um we launched last year and uh, we aim to run it until 2023 depending on the market we'll see if there will be need for another phase or also like a different type of intervention um in terms of scaling the the program what a great question 
Um, I think one part is, um, let me think about it actually. <laughs> um, I guess generally, first of all, like in entrepreneurship, um, even though there has been, for example, Bragg or Grameen Phone being very active in Bangladesh, which create a quite a unique environment for introducing the concept of impact entrepreneurship in Bangladesh because people are not entirely uh, foreign to the concept of the pro poor business idea. But at the same time, um, the kind of rigor that we are asking for uh, that we require to structure impact linked finance do is uh, kind of pushing the uh, frontier a little bit more further. So that's definitely something that requires much more work. Um, and in terms of capacity building, um, which is what we're trying to do to lift the whole ecosystem in terms of understanding of what impact measurement is, um, I think it has been a very interesting past two years uh, because we have to simply adjust what we're doing to fully online mode. And I think that is probably a, an idea or potential solution for how we are going to scale up this particular capacity building efforts that we're delivering. When it comes to um, offering catalytic funding to impact enterprises, we're actually also um, uh, in the process of organizing other strategic funds um, in other parts of the world at the moment. And that will be uh, probably also um, kind of a little bit of a peak view uh, into how we see how we want to scale what we're doing right now. Uh, but again, I think um, for a program that entails all these different parts is quite unique um, and unusual. What we're trying to do is definitely also to capture all the learnings and reflect it and share it to uh, the wider audience uh, so that um, this beauty program is not only like generating impact through the direct support that we're offering, but also really sharing insights and um, what can be done in the future, what can be improved and how the different players in the ecosystem can tape in. Um, so that's what we would envision, um, maybe to become a lighthouse project for many other future programs um, in terms of supporting impact inv uh, investing ecosystem. Awesome, thank you so much, Maxime. Uh, so we'll try to come back to you. I know you have to leave in about 15 minutes, but uh, we'll go to the other panelists and, and we'll try to come back to you when we uh, have the kind of um, you know cooperative uh, questions. But thank you so much for that overview, Maxime. Sure, thanks a lot. Let me see if I can stop sharing my screen. <laughs> All right. No worries. Uh, Sajid Pai, uh, welcome. Uh, you know, uh, if you're allowed, so we actually uh, took the liberty of kind of introducing you at, at the top of this, um, and some people are a bit familiar, but uh, welcome, Sajid Pai, uh, and thank you, thank you so much for joining the, the panel. Sure, thanks. It's a pleasure. No worries. And also, as a disclaimer, you know, very privileged uh, to have Sajid Pai as part of the governing board of Bangladesh Angels, along with Tina Appa. So we've been kind of working with this uh, since the beginning. Um, you know, you've been investing for close to a decade. And, and what's really remarkable is you've been investing across different markets, particularly in frontier markets, particularly in the Southeast Asian context. Um, you know, I guess one question I always want to ask you is, you know, how does Bangladesh compare to regional markets that are maybe a little bit more mature, let's say Indonesia. And in particular, I guess the question that people like us working in Bangladesh want, want to know is, you know, what are the, the things that we need to work on uh, to be able to have the, or to see the volume of activity, particularly when it comes to raising investments that we are seeing in markets that you're familiar with, such as Indonesia? Sure, no, thanks, Major. Uh, so one of my fond thesis is that, you know, see if all countries are on the same digitization curve, but at different points. And I think, you know, Bangladesh is so, sort of, you know, so if you look at it, India, uh, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and probably China and US on the other end, uh, there are, you know, you can see the same sort of uh, companies are playing out. Uh, essentially, uh, the idea is not very unique, but the execution is somewhat uh, localized and at scale, right? So uh, uh, that's what we are seeing Latin uh, Africa and Asia. Uh, so if you ask me about Bangladesh, I think it is probably, uh, you know, uh, three, four years behind uh, compared to, you know, Indonesia markets like that in terms of the volume, in terms of the deal flow that we see. Uh, but saying that, you know, there's always uh, in a curve what happens is sometimes you see uh, companies jumping out, right? So so if you look at ShopUp where, you know, I had the opportunity to invest very early, uh, uh, you know, ShopUp has done one of the largest Series B into B2B SaaS space across South Asia. Right? So, 
So th these are the companies which really jump up because uh, they are exhibiting so well and they're addressing such a challenge uh, in a market like Bangladesh that, that really helps. In terms of uh, you know what we need to do to get more deal flow, I think the question would be more like, or the answer would be more like, uh, you know, get more companies out. I think we are we are building the ecosystem. Pinapa has been instrumental in doing that uh, in Bangladesh context. But uh, uh, you know, I mean, these uh, these are more like a virtuous uh, you know uh, uh, circle where you have good startups, you have good startups getting good funding, good funding result to larger startup, larger startup result to exit and exit results to more people coming into this ecosystem. Right? So we need to see a couple more exits, uh, large scale exits, and then we'll probably see uh, the startup ecosystem is completely, you know, uh, sort of like a, a, you know, a, a burst of uh, new ideas and new companies coming out. Uh, but I mean, uh, it's a question of probably a few years. Coming full circle, so to speak, um, and, yeah. and you mentioned Shop Up, and thanks for that example. I, I know you also in my Asia VCs portfolio. There's a couple other companies along that context of kind of localized execution at scale. Chaldal being one, Truck Club Bay being another, who both managed to raise you know major rounds during the pandemic. In addition to Shop Up, and just curious, you know, why was that? Right? I mean, was I mean, just curious, you know, was it that they saw a lot of uh, was there a lot of digitization and adoption of digital services in the in the pandemic in Bangladesh? Was it a combination of that plus the founders? You know, what, what were some elements that allowed them to actually continue to scale and accelerate their growth during the pandemic? Charlton and Shop Up definitely, uh, because you know they are in the space which is uh, where the COVID and the subsequent digitization act as a, you know uh, uh, really as an act as a tailwind. Because you know, so just to give a context, uh, Chaltal is building the Instacart for Bangladesh, so providing groceries and other services uh, at, uh, at at the door doorstep. Uh, Shop Up is uh, can be considered as Udan, uh, so a, bit, a large marketplace for B two B. But they also have then gone into business financing and kind of buy down pay later, which is a which is a big concept across countries. So all these fit in a lot of investors' box. So they really uh, attracted attention. And of course, then because of the whole COVID thing and digitization, uh, you know, boom around the, along that line, their their numbers really scaled up. In terms of track like which is a bit interesting because they had a bit of uh, you know as it happened that during the early days of COVID everything stopped right so obviously track like is, is a tracking platform uh, so essentially they had a bit of a slowdown but they were very good to really pick it up uh, because they started doing uh, some product tweaks which really helped P two P track sharing and stuff like that so that really helped one thing which probably is very interesting to note is uh, the people who have been leading these uh, deals the recent round so. IFC came in both for Chaldal and Truck Like Day. And IFC has been investing in similar companies. So IFC invested in a company called Cobalt 360, which is a similar platform in Africa. And IFC has been doing some investment across markets. So they essentially know that where these companies are growing, they understand the trend and they understand the potential of these companies in markets like Bangladesh. Shabab, of course, has a number of very well-known fintech investors on the cap table who has, who has seen the model playing out across markets. So, one of the things we are seeing is that the lead investors, especially the international investors, who are coming in to lead these rounds are, are sort of probably following the same thesis, i.e. They, they believe that Bangladesh is on the same path at a different points, but they see they have seen these the models played out. Also curious, you know, so you deal with thousands of you know, different investors of, of different stripes and different stages, including angel investors through your syndicate. Uh, and one, one thing I've been noticing is that a lot of this early stage funding is kind of fungible, right? It goes across borders. There's a lot of people interested in different opportunities across these borders, maybe along that thesis. And so just curious, you know, what are the questions that these, uh, you know, your syndicate members, for example, might be asking about Bangladesh? And, and is it different from what they were maybe asking two or three years ago? So one of the common questions that come across is the regulatory landscape, uh, because most of these investors are US-based. So they essentially are wondering what, what is the exact exit route uh, for companies there? What are the you know macro challenges uh, from economic context, which I think given the growth rate of Bangladesh that has been addressed to a significant way, but uh, essentially it's about the regulations, what happens, how does how do the exit happens and things like that. So so you know, so what we are what we have done, or I personally have done as a solo GP is. I have this syndicate, which is sort of like a free form where there's no specific thesis. Uh, you know, you just bring in a deal and people on their interests uh, invest. But then I also have now two funds. So one is specifically focused on late stage deals, i.e. 
pre-IPO deals, uh, you know, which would probably, uh, you know, billion plus valuation and looking at a uh, in the next two, three years. And then I have another fund, which essentially focus on uh, FinTech in frontier markets. So, uh, you know, so which I believe is a, is a, is a big potential uh, across countries. And I also want to just touch base on, I think you have a very unique vantage point as an investor because you're also an operator. Uh, and you know, you, and another kind of element there is you built uh, a med tech company that has also started in Bangladesh, but then have also been replicated uh, in, in other markets. So could you tell us a little bit about the med tech company you built uh, and, and some challenges you had, and I guess, scaling it in the context of Bangladesh? So, uh, so health tech is, uh, you know, so health tech is a very interesting space because there are, you know, there are different ways people are addressing it. So one is a typical, uh, you know, a group of startups which are essentially trying to address public health challenges, i.e. access to healthcare. Uh, and you have similar companies like HelloDoc, uh, doctors uh, across borders, doctors anywhere. So the, the digital health business that we built in essentially along that line, which is uh, helping people, you know, access to healthcare remotely, whether it's doctors, but given the Bangladesh context, we had a big fi- health financing component in it. And then of course, you know, it, it, it evolved into a, a situation where people can order medicines and, you know, health equipments and stuff like that. But what we noticed is, uh, you know, if we look at sol- solving the access to healthcare problem, just being digital is difficult and there needs to be a big offline component, uh, you know, built in so that a person's healthcare journey, as well, it starts at home or, you know, whatever it is, then if the person ends up in a tertiary or you know secondary care, there is something uh, that can be that can connect the data across these uh, you know different points, and that's what we started adding it because I think uh, for healthcare digital only channel while well, it can scale, is difficult to monetize. Um, and, uh, and you know for the monetization to happen, there needs to be a lot of uh, offline component that needs to be built in. Makes sense. No, thank you so much uh, for that, Sajid Pai. So, you know, please bear with us. So we'll go now to Tinapa and then we'll go to the reflection sure. questions to the panelists. Uh, but thank you so much, Sajid Pai. And welcome Tinapa, uh, Tina Jabin uh, from, uh, she's, it's quite late her time in, uh, in West Coast US. So we're very appreciative. Uh, if uh, we took the liberty of introducing you at the top of the, uh, the panel, uh, but thank you so much for joining us, Tinapa. Thank you, Nijar. It's wonderful to be here. Hi, Sajid, good to see you. Awesome. Um, And also the disclaimer is, you know, Tinapa has been instrumental in the founding of uh, Bangladesh Angels. And uh, we're also working on a few initiatives, uh, particularly focused on women investors. Uh, You know, so Tinapa, you know, we kind of introduced your, we gave you a biography at the beginning of the the conversation. And one of the, I guess the key elements is obviously you're the the founding CEO of Startup Bangladesh Limited. And so for the benefit of those in the room, could you tell us about, I guess, the Startup Bangladesh Limited itself, the goals and aims of the organization, particularly as you guys were launching this in 2020? Sure, thank you, Nijar. Um, so Startup Bangladesh Limited is a venture capital fund. It's about $65 million size and wholly funded by the government of Bangladesh. It is, it is a pioneering initiative um, for the government of Bangladesh um, led by ICT ministry. And I had the opportunity to launch the fund and um, made, made it operational and made the uh, first seven um, investments. Um, so uh, basically the mission uh, for, for the fund is to enable and um, support the very, very nascent uh, startup ecosystem in Bangladesh. Um, so we, we provide funding for three types of funding. So one is, uh, which is, you know, very early st- seed stage um, uh, startups about uh, one crore BDT, which is about $120,000. And then um, about 600 some thousand dollar for um, growth stage startups. And we also provide small size grants. Um, so I had the opportunity to, you know, to work with um, all the ecosystem players uh, in Bangladesh, including, you know, obviously Bangladesh Angels and, you know, investors such as Sajid and many other. Um, um, and you know the main goal um, was to really provide not just funding, but also to bring all the key stakeholders um, uh, in the startup ecosystem uh, together. Um, so the fund started about a year ago, 
and um, I finished my um, tenure, um, you know, just recently. Um, and we are on to, you know, making uh, more investments. Uh, we have launched um, a campaign uh, to invest in 50 startups this year because we are celebrating the birth centennial of uh, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the father of the nation, um, and also the 50th anniversary of Bangladesh. Um, and the, the type of investments that we have done, you know, the, the vintage one investment that we have done this year is mostly in, you know, in logistics, um, education technology, very, very, um, uh, very, you know, big globally, uh, but also in Bangladesh, because we are trying to reach the last mile uh, client. Um, the other one is, you know, e-commerce, um, Chaldal is one of our investment. Uh, Patau, which is ride sharing, um, you know, uh, big potentials in Bangladesh, um, and then also mental well-being, Monir Bondhu, and you know, talking about telemed, we also invested in uh, Dhaka Cast, and also a SaaS platform, which is um, intelligent machine, uh, and education technology, which is uh, Eduhive. Um, so you know, all of these areas are extremely. Um, uh, big in Bangladesh and just in Bangladesh market, you know, uh, of course, cross border is big, but, you know, just in Bangladesh market, you know, this, the, they, they have a very, very big market in all these verticals. Um, and, you know, I was listening to Maxime uh, from Biniyog Bridhi, and, you know, it's, um, it's really great to see that um, these type of impact uh, investor platforms are coming into Bangladesh. I also work very closely with Light Castle Partners um, and um, you know, the other um, uh, developmental agencies which are uh, working on impact investment um, space. Um, and we, what we want to do you know, is um, to ensure that the startups that we are funding, the platforms which are coming to invest in Bangladesh is you know they have um, they have an ecosystem they have the um, the environment where uh, you know we have the right type of policies we have uh, proper um, um, incentives um, so that you know we can also attract uh, more investors locally and globally. Excellent, thank you so much for that. And I think um, so. I, I, you know, I do hear that. Uh, and I do see also, I mean, having interacted with Startup Bangladesh, that a key co component is obviously co-investments, but also kind of, I guess, collaborations with existing nodes and initiatives such as Be Bridhi and, and investors like Sajid Pai and, and Ban as well. Uh, you know, I, I guess, you know, um, and, and thank you so much, Maxime. I know you have to leave, uh, but it was a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for joining us uh, and we hope to see you soon. Um, you know, Tina, but, you know, another question I had, you know, as you kind of, you know, you've been doing this throughout your tenure, and now uh, you know you're going to be focusing more and more on this. Is obviously the work that you do on regional forums, but also in particular with the diaspora groups, and that's something I you know wanted to kind of um, you know ask you more about. Is as you make your way through, as you interact with um, a lot of different um, you know people who are looking at the Bangladesh market, whether they're already involved with it or not. What are one the questions they're asking, and second, you know, what do you what opportunities do you see? What bridges can you build? Uh, can you and others, you know, help build to be able to bring them back to Bangladesh? Thanks, Nishar. I think um, I'll I'll answer the first one, first question, and the type of questions that you know I am being asked when um, you know uh, I'm based in Silicon Valley, and there's a huge diaspora. A uh, very tech focused diaspora, but also this diaspora, they want to give back to Bangladesh and um, uh, they want to be engaged, engaged, you know, funding startups, engaged in mentoring um, uh, startups, you know, to, to basically uh, kind of um, transfer knowledge. Um, so, what the common question that, you know, I get asked is, um, you know, how easy it is to just you know, make it an investment because it's a cross-border investment. Um, you know, to just um, uh, basically um, you know transfer the fund and whatnot. So that's a very common question. But I think that you know what's what is um, what really uh, they are trying to understand is that you know do I have um, trusted operators, right? 
because you know these guys are all um, offshore, you know, in different countries, and they want to make sure that you know their money is um, um, being invested by a trusted operator. Um, so you know we don't have that many Sajids in Bangladesh, right? I mean, so and it's a very very um, new uh, ecosystem. So I think that you know the challenge is to um, to bring in or to support um, building up trusted operators uh, who are uh, who are ready and who can who has that um, uh, the brand uh, to uh, you know attract uh, not just uh, non NR non Bangladeshi um, uh, institutions um, but also you know a very very strong um, affluent. Uh, Bangladeshi diaspora all over the world, especially in the in the Silicon Valley. Um, so you know that responsibility, I think you know, um, uh, stays with all of us. Uh, you know, each of us uh, needs to be advocate and ambassadors of Bangladesh wherever we go. And uh, that has been one of my mission. Uh, one of the reason I went back to Bangladesh is because you know I wanted to go back and. Um, kind of uh, participate in uh, building the ecosystem um, and also to support and promote the uh, startups, the flag bearers, such as, you know, Chaldal and Patao and shop ups and whatnot. Um, and um, Nijar, what's, what's the second question? No, no you answered it. You, you talked about oh, the diaspora uh, for sure. Yes. Uh, and, you know, and yeah, and another question I wanted to ask you, and it was kind of timely because you know it was actually on last night's or or yesterday morning's The Atlantic about how you know, and it was by a Bangladeshi scholar, you know, talking about how Bangladesh has been quite resilient when it comes to climate change. And so, you know, this being Suncup Forum, you know, curious, you know, beyond the the sectors that you have already invested in um, uh, through SBL and also through the Idea Project, um, are there examples of startups and companies in, you know, let's say the realm of climate resilience, climate mitigation, or, or even clean tech uh, that you were uh, looking at, or, you know, maybe do you see some opportunities uh, to invest in Bangladesh? You know, I, I, we haven't invested in directly in, um, you know, climate resilient or uh, clean tech, green tech type of companies yet. But um, there are, you know, I have seen um, good companies, and I'm sure, you know, you probably know about this, uh, companies who, you know, who are working with, you know, clean water, um, working with, um, uh, with agri, in the agri tech area. Um, but I, I think that, you know, those type of companies are less common than, you know, companies where are like the e-commerce and logistics and whatnot. But um, I think that there is less attention in that area, but there is um, huge potential. So uh, probably, you know, we'll see some of these um, companies, um, you know, coming into the space um, going forward. Um, but definitely, you know, um, agri-tech is an area where, you know, we are seeing um, a lot of activity. And um, although, you know, this is not about climate, climate uh, resilience, um, uh, you know, the gender lens financing has been a big thing. And, um, you know, it's all uh, feeding to our sustainable development goal, um, uh, uh, which we need to um, achieve by um, 2030. And, and that's a great point uh, about kind of both kind of meeting the SDGs and, and gender lens. Um, so I'd love to bring, you know, Sajid Pai back in uh, and to kind of ask both of you, right? Because obviously Maxime was here, she's coming from an explicitly impact standpoint. Uh, you have, you know, different investors uh, who might interpret the word impact differently, uh, different stakeholder groups. And so maybe, you know, Sajid Pai, for example, you know, how did you look or how do you look at impact as part of a set, your assessment for My Asia VC? So in general, uh, the investments that we do, uh, so, you know, so in fact is, uh, I mean, from an investment angle, all technology companies, uh, or not all, I mean, 99% of companies 
has an impact, right? So whether it's a blockchain, which brings probably more transparency to FinTech, which is bringing, you know, uh, financial services to health tech, health tech, right? So all these companies, including e-commerce, which is helping in a lot of, you know, income generations, employments and stuff like that. So, so all companies have an impact uh, to a significant extent. The way they impact funds usually define it is essentially have a impact, uh, you know, target. So for example, let's say I want to set up an impact fund, which only focus on health tech, then the fund will have a very clear target. The companies that we invest in, they will generate this level of, you know, uh, positive impact on the, on the healthcare sector, i.e. in terms of access to healthcare, in terms of reducing mortality, in terms of uh, better mental health, stuff like that. So I think that's the way uh, impact focused fund has those criteria. For my investment, I do not go on those specific criteria on it at, at, at an investment or at a company level. But of course, you know, uh, whenever a company that I invest in is, I always look at, you know, what is going to be the long term market of the company, which essentially a factor of how much impactful the company will be. So, uh, so that's the way I look at it. Uh, it, it. And that ties in with that question of TAM. And, and how much, how large it can grow and, and how many people it can serve uh, as well. Um, and, and Tina, but, you know, for you guys, for you as well, you know, when you look at a company, obviously you're working with commercially or with the commercial lens on one side, uh, but, you know, for example, when it's a platform like SPL or IDEA, it's also looking at national objectives. So just curious, you know, how does that work? You know, how does impact uh, or what does impact mean from a, a government-backed VC perspective or a government-backed uh, uh, program perspective? Thanks, Ninshur. Um, So for Startup Bangladesh, you know, we do have we do have verticals where, you know, we do make investments, keeping in mind that, you know, what is the impact um, in general? So, for example, you know, we look at uh, companies where they are working in mental well-being space, probably not superbly commercially viable. Um, probably not hugely scalable um, in a way, but you know it is creating uh, it is you know creating big impact uh, because that is an area which is very very underserved in Bangladesh for sure you know mental well being so we keep that in mind. The other thing is you know gender lens financing. Just in general. You know, there is huge impact if you are funding, supporting, you know, women led startups or startups who are somehow um, indirectly empowering, financially empowering women. There will be a huge social impact. So you do keep those um, kind of that lens in your mind when you are making the investments. Right. And just in general, um, agritech in our mandate, you know, we do have to invest in like um, uh, funds, uh, startups who are in the agritech, edutech, fintech space, although it's hard for Bangladesh, Bangladeshi startups to work in the fintech space because of all, all, all kinds of you know, regulations and whatnot. But still, you know, that is a, that is one vertical. And just in general, what um, the way, you know, we have. Uh, done uh, the first uh, invest set of investments is that you know how these are feeding into the national perspective plan, which is basically you know just uh, making sure that um, we are uh, we are providing solutions um, which is going to um, change lives of millions. Bangladesh is a very very um, um, you know it has a, a large population, so just you know keeping that in mind. You know, you will have huge impact um, to begin with, right? Impact at scale, and I think you know, it goes back to Sajid Pai's uh, point about kind of reaching, or or does this solution have a, a chance to reach uh, many lives and many people? Um, another question. So that's always interesting to ask. Obviously, investors. The other interesting perspective that might differ um, from investor to investor is obviously that uh, the E word uh, that we talked about with Sajid Pai earlier, exits. And so for for both of you, you know, so so Sajid Pai and also for Tina, uh, uh, for your investments in Bangladesh or for investments that are operating in Bangladesh, how do you think about exits and, and, and what makes sense for your particular investment thesis and, and your investors? Uh, 
So, okay, so uh, let me go first. So I, I personally think uh, the companies that, you know, that we just talked about either Shop Up, Jaldal, uh, you know, Crack Like Bay, Patao. Uh, so these companies, uh, you know, they are so big and they're so successful. I don't think exits will be an issue in the sense that, you know, they'll either be acquired by one of these very large global companies trying to enter Bangladesh market, or, you know, there's always this option to, you know, to go to IPO or public at some point, right? So I don't think uh, that to be an issue. Uh, the challenge probably when investors think of it is there is no example as such, right? So that's what the worry uh, that, okay, you know, we're investing, it's a, you know, it's a long game, but we're going to invest for next seven, 10 hours. How is the regulation evolving? What will the exit happens? But I think, you know, and it, it may happen sooner than we think, uh, you know, uh, so a couple of these companies will probably exit at, uh, I'm assuming in the next three, four, five years. And then, then that will start the whole, uh, th that will bring actually completely new light on the, on the startup ecosystem. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, there are many ways to exit uh, for all these specific companies. Uh, thank you. Uh, and Tina, how do you think about exits, um, you know, particularly once again, in the context of when you're dealing with, you know, public funds? Um, it's in kind of the same line that Sajid was saying that, you know, these companies, the, the, the companies that we have invested so far, uh, we have already seen um, a very positive valuation, up valuations um, in them. Uh, because some of them are into um, uh, fundraising and whatnot. Um, so, you know, either it's going to be um, acquired by a very large company um, or, um, you know, there is going to be some sort of a, uh, IPO. Now, talking about IPO, you know, we don't really have right now the right platform um, in the, the stock market for a, uh, to bring, you know, these type of, to bring startups to IPO, basically. Uh, but um, fortunately, you know, there is a there is a, a small cap market that is going to be exchange that is going to be um, that's in the process, which is going to be launched sometime during this year. And I think that will be very, very helpful uh, for our startups because, you know, the investors will know that, OK, there is this if I want, you know, there is this exit that's that can happen through an IPO people who are more used to. Um, seeing IPO, especially, you know, uh, folks who are uh, the foreign investors, right, the more um, very uh, professional VCs and whatnot. Um, but, you know, it's like Bangladesh. Um, I see like Bangladesh is like, you know, one of the best uh, market to invest in right now in startups, because um, it's truly the country is at a growth trajectory. And um, the startups uh, who are here, um, uh, we, you know, who are kind of active um, and really kind of um, have good traction, um, you know, the market is very large. So I, I think that, you know, as a promoter of our Bangladesh startup ecosystem, I say that, you know, this is the place to invest. And you just, you know, you basically need to be patient and uh, uh, you have to have, uh, you know, that uh, uh, long term horizon. Um, at least three to five years, probably five years. Excellent. Um, I know we've got about 10 minutes left, so I, I want to go to the audience questions and, and would like to kind of give it to both of you as well. Um, so for uh, for both, you know, Sajid Pai and Tina, uh, how do you kind of see the, um, you know, tech solutions kind of leapfrogging uh, when it comes to, say, fintech or healthcare? Uh, and, and maybe, you know, from your examples, whether it's companies you've worked with or have invested in, maybe you could give us a couple of examples. Uh, maybe I'll go with Sajid Pai first. Bikash is actually a leapfrog significant. You know, when Bikash started and they started, you know, they, they brought in this huge P2P payment network, uh, you know, with millions of people. Uh, I used to go to all these countries that they, they never, you know, they didn't have anything similar to Bikash. Right? So the only example you have M-Pesa and the other example is Bikash. And then you have see the swath of countries in between, <laughs> which never had developed anything like Bikash, which was a bit of a surprise. Uh, and that only happened because of the huge, uh, you know, mobile penetration, and uh, you know, the way the whole pro product is developed, you know, based on USSD, which is very easy to use and you don't need a smartphone to use the products and services like that. Right? So, so that would be, I guess, one of the uh, big examples of how technology is leapfrogging and bringing a lot of uh, people under financial umbrella. 
Got it. Got it. Um, and and also to 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 Gina up as well. Uh, you know, particularly let's say in the healthcare space, maybe you know Monir Bundu is a great example of you know trying to increase access to mental health. Uh, what are some ways in which um, you know, yeah. Well, what are some what are some best practices you've seen when it comes to you know healthcare companies trying to reach a population that might not be digitally na native, that might not have easy access to digital platforms? Um, so I think you know not just healthcare, um, Nijar. Uh, we we can also look into um, ed education technology, right? Uh, from Bangladesh Angels Network, you were part of this um, exercise where. Um, we worked with the education ministry where, you know, last year in the middle of COVID, you know, our education technology startups, about a dozen of them, we put them together and, you know, um, uh, for, uh, for this whole very big project where, you know, they created all the online classes, the national curriculum um, approved classes for the ministry. And um, which were all, you know, televised in the in the TV uh, through education ministry specific channels. And obviously, you know, uh, students. There are students, last mile students. They were either um, accessing these through the TV televisions or, you know, through their uh, phone. Um, it's not perfect, right? Because you know, um, we don't have. I mean, not everybody has a smartphone. Um, but but at the same time, you know there is um, because of this internet penetration, um, it's like all over every single corner of Bangladesh, right? Um, so so you know these students um, at the last mile students, uh, they were able to continue with their education. Uh, so I feel that you know in or for healthcare, same thing. You know Monir Bondhu. Um, which I think is a is one of the very successful uh, mental well-being startups, uh, where you know they took on projects from uh, UNDP, uh, large projects, you know, where they have been uh, they were engaged with thousands and thousands of uh, uh, patients. Uh, they were um, you know fielding questions, uh, calls. Uh, from thousands of patients. So I think, you know, in these two areas, um, definitely, you know, co because of COVID, um, the users, they had to leapfrog. And also this gave the, uh, the startups in these two space opportunity to really to scale up. I mean, you know, uh, I think that um, education technology and health tech startups, mental well-being especially, you know, they, this was like a, a real uh, barrier for them. Uh, now, what we need to do is, is we need to make sure that you know we keep we keep supporting them. We give them the right platform to the end users because you know we need to make sure that people, the students, they have the smartphone or tablet or whatever that is. And at the same time, we give the startups the proper support so they can have the same right um, you know right uh, type of technology, the platforms and whatnot. Um, so I think, you know, again, um, these two areas are very, very, have very good potentials. And um, this is an example of leapfrogging, leapfrogging. And, you know, uh, Sajid already talked about the fintech. I mean, Bikash uh, had been a lifesaver for sure during COVID. Leapfrogging, but also uh, I like the example of the public-private partnership, right? That you could potentially, you know, piggyback off of government infrastructure, government programs, uh, public sector priorities to be able to potentially scale uh, as well, particularly in something like healthcare or education. Um, another question that um, came through and also worth at, you know, asking for both of you, you know, what are, you know, tr trust is key, obviously, to get investors to invest, especially if they're offshore, as, as Tina Appa mentioned. You know, if you were to kind of, obviously, policy making is difficult, uh, policy advocacy is difficult, Maxime talked about it at the beginning. Um, what are some challenges or what are some ongoing, um, you know, uh, things you'd like to see from a policy standpoint, maybe change in the context of Bangladesh to be able to unlock more investments in the startup sector. Maybe I'll, I'll go with Sajid Lai first. So one would be, you know, how, um, so a couple of things, right? So the whole uh, regulations around setting up a venture capital business in Bangladesh, uh, that needs to be streamlined. Uh, 
you know, I mean, uh, compared to many other countries, uh, that that area is not as robust as we would like to. Uh, second would be, uh, which is a very interesting. I mean, if you look at the data in US, what, you know, US was at one stage, they were struggling in, uh, and I'm talking about a couple of decades back, they're really struggling in terms of getting uh, all the venture money or the risk capital coming into companies. Uh, and that in, in a way was impacting the innovation and the growth of the of the state, right? So the economy of the state. So uh, what uh, some of them did very prudently is change the taxation. So if you're investing in a long-term, if you're investing long-term risk capital in a company where you know the risk is very high and your money is stuck for five, 10 years, then there was a significant tax incentive. And that actually opened the flood door of all these monies kept in other assets to come through these risk assets, right? So, so that's a that's a very uh, way we uh, that's a very interesting examples out there, which I think we can obviously uh, you know look into Bangladesh. The third would be uh, you know because going to the second point, the big challenge for Bangladesh is that there's a lot of wealth, but which are invested in other sectors, right? The real estate and some other sectors, which actually need to, not all, but a portion of it needs to move into startup. And the third, of course, you know, as we, as we talked about this, how how do we ensure that these companies get uh, you know IP, can do an IPO? Uh, given the specifics of startups, you know, their cash flows and their, you know, the, they don't make a profit very early on. So given all those nuances of, uh, of the balance sheet of a startup, how can we do an IPO uh, in the Bangladesh context? So I guess these would be the top three in, for me. Make it easier to raise and, and launch venture capital funds, uh, you know, create, make it easier and, and more investor friendly when it comes to uh, taxation and also to create the infrastructure in place for exits, and, uh, particularly from a local context. Um, Tina, but would you add um, in, any other kind of policy challenges uh, that you might have encounter encountered? I think that well, the other thing is um, that I would two more things. So one is um, you know to make it easy for the money in and out. You know, um, we need to we need to make it more of a it's like you know how you transfer money from uh, MFS account. It needs to be that type of easy. Obviously, you need to bring put in you know your a AML and EKYC and all kinds of stuff. But you have to make it you know very easy for um, for investors to transfer these funds. Uh, we do have a very good um, you know it's pretty good um, um, uh, taxation policies. You know, if you if an investor brings in foreign investors, brings in money, uh, invest in Bangladesh, you know, the capital, um, uh, the capital gain tax, there are uh, exemptions in the ICT sector. Uh, 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 and there is also, um, I think, in, you know, pretty um, lenient, um, uh, like a tax holiday for 10 years or something like that. But the other thing, the second point is, you know, we need to see exits. So once we see exits, you know, we have to have precedence, right? So that the, uh, the investors who are bringing in money or the angel investors, they see that, oh, okay, you know, in Chaldal, if I, I if child, if there is an exit in Chaldal, I, you know, they will say, oh, okay, so it's easy. This is how, this is how it happens. And, uh, oh, by the way, um, uh, startup is, uh, way, uh, way more profitable, you know, investment in startup is way more profitable than in just traditional investments. Um, so I think that, you know, these two things and also what Sajid just mentioned is we need to just, um, we, we just need to build up on the positive story. And I truly believe that it will happen. I mean, we have a very uh, young ecosystem and, you know, couple of couple more years and uh, we will uh, we will have a more a story which is going to be which is going to give confidence to our investors local or foreign uh, another question that came up, I think we've got time for one more, uh, for both, you know, what is your advice for entrepreneurs in Bangladesh who are looking to raise VC funding? Uh, from your experience, what are some things that they need to work on? Uh, let me go first. Uh, so I, I think a couple of things, right? So I mean, well, as I you know talk with founders across uh, you know, across countries and different regions, so I think one of the areas uh, uh, Bangladeshi founders can improve on is the whole confidence and presenting uh, you know the, the idea. 
the case, you know, at the end of the day, a startup is mostly, uh, you know, as a founder, you have to be a very good storyteller, right? Uh, you, somewhere you have to believe, make people believe in your vision. So people live up their nice, cushy jobs and join you or people part with their money and put it into your company. So uh, founder needs to be a really good storyteller. And I think that's one area, you know, I, I, if you look at the founders like Wasim or Afif or, you know, so anyone doing all these large raises, they're all very good storytellers, right? So I think that's uh, very important uh, for startups uh, to really founders to really pick it up. And then of course, you know, uh, uh, really understand who to approach, when to approach, because different found VCs are very different pieces, very different, you know, a stage uh, that they want to focus on, very different check sizes. So the the entrepreneurs really need to do do those research before uh, they you know they approach a, a, a venture capital in raising funds. And the third, of course, is uh, is the scope of the business. I mean, Bangladesh actually is a very large market. You know, the domestic, I mean, you know, I sometimes see people preaching, they're going to go to Nepal or some other countries. We really need, don't need to do that. I mean, Bangladesh itself is a very large market and, and you know, billion dollar companies can easily be built here. It's a question of, you know, uh, just uh, putting out that, uh, that the size and the scale of the market uh, during the storytelling, that's very critical. Excellent. And Tina Pa? No, I think that, you know, um... Other than uh, what what Sajid just mentioned, I think um, you know you need to look at um, the solution that you are selling. Um, is there a, is there a market for it, right? Or is it something because you are good at and you think that you know that is that's what you will sell? So I think you know your addressable market needs to be. Um, you need to make sure that you do have an addressable market, and the solution that you're selling can be. Um, you know, can be scaled up. And I 100% agree with uh, Sajid that, you know, Bangladesh market is so large, you don't have to go anywhere. In fact, if you just go to a couple of the cities, because we have this huge density dividend, um, and if you do it well, you know, that's it, you know, you, you'll be good. Um, so, so make sure that, you know, what you're selling, uh, it has a large, um, addressable market, it can be scalable. Um, and the other thing is, um, again, um, you know, make sure that um, you have a good management team. And don't jump into the bandwagon of everybody's doing this, so I will also do it. You know, not everybody um, is has the gene uh, or the DNA of a startup founder, okay? Startup is not for everybody. So know that, you know, know yourself first before getting into, uh, you know, uh, this uh, this path. And 100% agree that, you know, the VCs, they every VC have their own allocations, their own mission. Um, some invest in very early stage seed uh, companies, some in growth companies and whatnot. Um, so you want to make sure that when you are looking for appointments and, um, you know, schedules and whatnot, um, you need to make sure that, you know, the, the investor that you are trying to meet, they, their investment um, uh, mission is aligned with, you know, what you are trying to sell um, uh, in your startup. Excellent. I think that's about all the time we have uh, for today. I think we're at the end of the, uh, at the top of the hour. Uh, thank you so much, Sajid Pai. Thank you so much, uh, Tina Appa, uh, for joining uh, from around the world. Thank you so much to Maxime as well. Uh, Jawad, I'll give the floor back to you. I think, uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, everyone, for joining in. And uh, this has been a really fruitful as well as a learning session for everyone who's tuned in from different parts of the world. Uh, thank you, Tina Appa, as well as uh, Nijar for making the time late at, uh, you know, or early hours in the morning for uh, US <laughs> and uh, Sajid Bhai as well. Uh, thank you so much for joining in. Um, and if you are in the, you know, um, participants list, if you can uh, come in and say a quick goodbye as well. Thank you so much for, you know, sharing your journey as an entrepreneur, as well as uh, the challenges uh, and impact uh, entrepreneurs sort of face uh, when they're raising. And um, I think this has been some of uh, the discussions that we have done today. We can sort of, um, you know, circulate within the public community, as well as our uh, members and, uh, you know, stakeholder groups. Um, I think they will benefit uh, from this uh, discussion a lot. And uh, Nirjar, uh, you've you know, always a, you know, wonderful job of uh, leading, as well as, uh, you know, um, 
getting panelists together as well as moderating. And thank you so much for you know leading the second half. Uh, it was really great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.